Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 320, the Where is Gavin edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Friday, the 8th of September, 2017. Okay, as I hinted to, Gavin is not in France, he's not uh, in Normandy, he's not in England, London, wherever. He has been traveling the, the, the vast regions of uh, the former Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, where are you today and what are you doing? Uh, well, I'm in Moscow, Kevin. And, okay. uh, I'm, on, I'm on a pilgrimage. Uh, and the exciting thing about this pilgrimage is it's a, uh, it's a pilgrimage for ecumenical unity, but most ecumenical pilgrimages... Uh, get stuck in arguments and disagreements about about the previous battles, and this one uh, is launched by a, a particular piece of prophetic witness that says the the way we get closer is by loving Jesus more and loving each other in Jesus, and that seems to work. There are 800 bishops, priests, and people from Orthodoxy, from Catholicism, from Protestantism, from Pentecostalism. Uh, and we're around one table, one also praising Jesus together. It's quite a big occasion. That's amazing because I was uh, a witness to the uh, 2008 two-hour uh, prayer book argument. Um, so I, I know yeah. how things can break down uh, real quickly within and without the, uh, uh, the church. I um, thought we'd uh, sit down and talk uh, about some news coming out of uh, England. There's two big stories. Uh, the first one, uh, the BBC looked at the numbers uh, with the Church of England and said, basically, uh, you guys are falling apart, which I'm, <laughs> the BBC supports. Let's not get, you know, be wrong here. That's, you know, that's their wish come true. Um, but uh, basically, the numbers have halved for the, uh, the Church of England. Yes, so this is a survey by something called the BSA, the British Social Attitude Survey, and the BBC have been reporting it, sure. And what they've discovered is for the first time in the history of the country, there are now more atheists than there are believers in the country. The number of, uh, of people who say they have no religion is, is 53%. So this is really a huge change in the social and spiritual makeup of the country. Never before have there been more atheists than believers together. Now, did... But, did, did this survey take into account Muslim, or is this just Christian uh, and atheist? Because uh, you've had I a large influx of, of you know, immigrant Muslims that would certainly have a, a faith in God. We have, but they're still only in single percentage figures. So they, okay. they don't, uh, in terms of overall numbers, they don't make a huge difference. They're, they make a big social difference because they concentrate in certain cities together where over half the people in the cities are Muslim. But if you dilute them within a total population, then there's still, they're still a small number. Okay. The, the, really, the really big thing for this was that uh, in the year 2000, 30% of those who believed called themselves Anglican. And in 17 years, that's dropped by a half. So the, it, 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 the Church of England's membership is hemorrhaging. Well, I, I thought the Church of England could just count all citizens anyway. You know, they, they don't need you to agree whether or not there's a God. We get to count you, you know, because basically, I mean, there is still mass baptism upon birth. You know, when a person in England is, is uh, born, there's no, not, 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 not anymore, anymore, huh? No, the baptism figures are, are, are hitting the ground and so are the funeral figures and the marriage figures. Um, so that when they calculate the numbers of the Anglican communion and they come up with 80 million, they say there are 23 million Anglicans in England. Well, the fact is only 600,000 of them ever go to church on a Sunday. So this, this number is a, is a leftover from uh, the, 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 the period when people, if they couldn't think of anything better to say, did they call themselves Anglican. But no more. Now they say they have no religion. 53%. Well, there was good news this week for the Roman Catholic Church uh, in England. There's a uh, individual who's running for, well, I forget what he's running for. <laughs> well, he says he's not running for anything, but uh, the fact is the, the Conservative Party, which are our, our kind of closest equivalent to the Republicans, yeah. um, the, the Prime Minister's in trouble, Theresa May, and so everyone is looking to see who's going to be the next Prime Minister. And there's this very, very colorful, eccentric man whose father used to be the 
editor of the Times called Jacob Rees Mock. Mm -hmm. He's in his 40s, but he, he sounds like he comes out of the 1930s. He's a, he's a Roman Catholic. He's, he's just had his sixth child, whom he calls Sextus, after Latin the sixth. Uh, and the, the reason why he matters is because he's suddenly being tipped as a possible successor for Theresa May, and so everyone's worried about his politics. And they've discovered he's a passionate Christian. So he, <laughs> How did he even get past the first? Oh, all right, all right. We can't allow Nobody this. Knows, you and I need to oppose they, this. <laughs> <laughs> they're horrified by it. And so the media, the last time the media found a Christian in politics during the, the general election, it was a guy called Tim Barron. Yep. Uh, Tim was leader of the smallest party we had. He's an evangelical. And so people, they, the, the media went after him and they said, do you believe that gay sex is a sin? And for weeks and weeks, he he, he, he ducked and dived, and finally he came out and said, maybe. And they, if you'll forgive the phrase, they crucified him. And he, well, they, cruci they crucified Tim for never answering the question, and then he, changed, he did what they wanted. He kind of yeah. agreed with, you know, in all, all things being equal, it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I side with you guys. So he kind of turned, changed his mind to be uh, appreciated and loved by the press, and it didn't work. They crucified him anyway. So, right. So first of all, he said it isn't. And then when they crucified, he said, okay, it is. And by this time, nobody believed him. Yeah. Uh, so, so here's Jacob rees -Mogg. Here's their next Christian victim. And so they say to him, uh, do you believe in, in gay marriage? And he says, I believe in the teaching of the church. Oh, boy. that's uh, You and, can't say that. On, and, and they didn't censor that? Was he bleeped on the BBC when he said this? Almost. They were absolutely furious. And then he said... He, he, he was a model. He said, do you believe gay, gay sex is a sin? This is, this is the test that you have to pass to be allowed to speak in public. And he said, he said the Bible teaches me that I'm not allowed to, make, to cast a judgment on people. And so uh, I myself have no judgment, though I recognize that Catholic teaching, Catholic, Catholic teaching following the Bible says it's a sin. So they kept on saying, well, what do you say? What do you say? And it's, I refuse to enter into judgment. I'm just telling you of the social teaching of the churches, which I uphold. They said, well, you're against them. And he said, no, no, I'm for. I'm totally for the teaching of my church. I'm not against anybody. And they, 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 they did the very best to humiliate him to the point where, of course, they looked mean, cantankerous, and, and, and he came across as a knight in shining armor, a man of integrity, willing to tell the truth, and risk the whole of his career. And so a whole lot of people have said, Fuck. and a Christian with integrity. And, and people got really quite excited. Well, no, it, it's fun. For me, this is the biggest embarrassment, not the numbers for, uh, from the, the uh, study for the Church of England, but that the only person in all of England standing up to the BBC and to the Telegraph and to um, all that is uh, media over there is a Roman Catholic. And the Roman Catholics are defending him. If a Anglican had done this at all anywhere within uh, the media, uh, you would have seen Justin Welby. Oh, well, yeah, there's, we're kind of divided on that issue right now. We're having good disagreement at this current time. Uh, and all the rest of the clergy and bishops will follow the same. Um, the reality is this man stood up with his faith. He's willing to take anything the media has to offer, and he's Roman Catholic. Uh, absolutely. And so the woman presenter said, well, what about abortion? Now, I, when I had a BBC radio program, someone phoned in once, and... Um, uh, while they were talking, uh, talking about abortion, I, I checked the figures, and I was horrified to discover that since we passed the Abortion Act, six million children uh, had been aborted. And mm -hmm. you know, the figure six million has a resonance in European history. So I said, carelessly, <laughs> I said, oh my goodness, that's the number of the Holocaust. Well, the next day I was pulled into the, the director's uh, office. I said, if you ever say that again, we'll fire you on air. We'll pull the plug that second. And I said, but it, it's just a fact. And they said, you're not allowed to say it on the BBC. So when, so when this guy said, they said, are you, are you against abortion? And he said, I'm completely, personally, and totally against abortion in all circumstances because, of my, because the teaching of the church is life begins at conception and you mustn't take the lives of other human beings. And then he tried everything on him. What if a woman is raped? What if, you know, absolutely everything. And he said, he said it, it, it is 
And then he says, how can you be personally against abortion but not personally against gay people? And he says, well, because the thing about abortion is people are taking responsibility for killing other people, and I'm very happy to be personally responsible <laughs> for saying that's a bad thing. Uh, but but the, 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 in fact, the next day in the time, it was one of the most revolting cartoons I'd ever seen. It was right. a picture of a womb, and in the womb was a uterus, and the uterus was a was a bear, was this bear, was Jacob rees bear with his glasses on. I mean, you know, adult head, but uterus body. Uh, and, and they said, um, you know, this man's leadership ambitions are now going to be aborted. Uh, it, was, it was literally, I think, the most revolting cartoon I've ever seen in my life. I've, I've written to the papers, to the Times, saying uh, that, that what this represents is not just a, an appalling cartoon, but it's an attempt to drive Christians out of public life. So that anyone who holds Christian ethics gets ridiculed uh, by, by all the media until they shut up or leave. And this, is, this is actually a fact. This is an attack on free speech. It's an attack on the face of Christians in the marketplace, in, in, in the, the public forum. I suggested, for example, if they want to draw cartoons on this theme, they might draw a theme about Muhammad and abortion. <laughs> well, and that's the reality that... Pierce Morgan would not sit down with a uh, um, a leader in the Muslim community and do the same thing, ask the same questions, and pre not not in a million years. As Christians, we have on our side science, reason, history, anthropology. Everything uh, is factually on our side, including scripture. Uh, and uh, it's amazing with all the facts and figures we have on our side uh, we will be pummeled in the media because we have not joined the collective we have we, we refuse to to sit back and be assimilated uh, um, as the old Star Trek phrase goes uh, from the Borg and it's just it's beyond reason how they treat uh, Christians in the press when they won't apply this to any other uh, religion Kevin, I like your phrase beyond reason because I think that's the key to the whole thing. Uh, it's obviously unfair. It's obviously not even-handed, but it's beyond reason. And my Christian journey has taught me that when things are beyond reason, that's the time when you start looking for a spiritual diagnosis. This is a campaign of spiritual and, uh, uh, and ethical hatred against Christ and against the Scripture and against the Church. They make no apology. Uh, they, they're not even ashamed they won't say the same thing to Muslims. They're just enraged with a kind of uh, a vituperous hatred against the gospel. Uh, and we have really entered a very different society now. The, the, the great thing about the, you know, I have to say, the courageous thing about the Roman Catholic Church is it will not compromise on its ethics, which it gets from the Bible. The embarrassing thing about being an Anglican is there are no, there, there are no Episcopal voices daring to stand up and say, this Christian politician is teaching the Christian faith and he needs our support. I, I, have, I have to say, what does it mean when a church has sunk that low, become that feeble, lost that degree of integrity? It, it, it's a shaming moment. No, listen, I call for any bishop who's not going to defend um, our, our good friend Jacob uh, just to quit. Stand down. Uh, you have lost... You are an embarrassment to Anglicanism, to Christianity, to Scripture, and to the person who died on the cross, uh, the very manhood of Jesus Christ. <sighs> well, I said my fair share. Um, when, when are you coming back to uh, good old England? Uh, the pilgrimage has, has, has lasted a, a week, uh, and I had to get up at 4 o'clock on Sunday morning and catch a flight from, from here, here to England. We've had a huge schedule. We, we're, we're, we're up most mornings at 6 o'clock, uh, breakfast and prayers by 7, and then out on the road by about half past 7. We've had a, an exciting and punishing schedule, but, but it's been quite wonderful to, 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 to see the whole church, Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox, all in love with Jesus. You, you suddenly realize what the church ought to look like. And when I go home, and I'm, I'm just amongst, if you like, you know, the people I love in the same brand, I've had a vision of the whole church, the whole body of Christ. And, uh, and the purpose of ecumenism is not to be nice to people. Uh, uh, it's not to tidy up the church that's gone wrong. 
uh, it's to put a broken body back again. So the beauty of the body of Christ can, can be seen in, in all, uh, in this sense, the proper use of the word is glorious diversity, the different gifts and charisms that the Holy Spirit has bestowed on the church. So it's been fantastic to be amongst 800 Christians across the denomination. It, it, it's wonderful to, you know, you and I have watched the church divide and divide and divide and divide over these generations. And for the first time, at least in the last four and a half, maybe five years, we're seeing people, you know, look for what we have in common. And beyond just ecumenicanism, uh, ecumenism, sorry, uh, but to, to, to develop strong bonds into how we can bring Christ back into the world, one, as one. And I was talking to a very senior bishop in the uh, ACNA um, who does relations with other churches. And uh, he was telling me, listen, you know, if this starts to really take hold, you're going to have to watch for what the Orthodox do, the Russian Orthodox. They're kind of, you know, uh, when they decide they want to, to be one again, it's going to happen. Uh, really? you know, the, the Russians? Are you, are you, come on, really? Oh, and he's like, Kevin, yeah. absolutely. You know, all right. The, the, the Russians are the key. This is what surprise people. The Russians are the key to the survival of Christianity in our generation. Mm. They, uh, the last time I was in Moscow, I was arrested and interrogated by the KGB. I had smuggled Bibles in. Uh, I was visiting well, Christians. You're going to admit it? Well, I can't. <laughs> well, no. and, uh, well, I can't put this out till Monday when you're out of the country again. <laughs> and since uh, since, 90, since 1983, when that happened, and and there were no Christians in the Soviet Union huh? beyond a minuscule number, uh, now over half the population identifies Russian. But here's the thing: we were having a meeting with the uh, with the uh, priest in charge of ecumenical affairs, external relations in the Kremlin, where the uh, where the patriarch worked. And we said to him, um, President Putin has congratulated the Russian Orthodox Church on its stand for Christian ethics and the Christian family, basically meaning against gay marriage, mm -hmm. for offering a kind of glue to hold society together. Uh, and one of the questions we said is, do you see any, you having any role in your ecumenical relations with other churches to encourage them to have the guts and the faithfulness that you've brought to bear in Russian society? And they said, it's at the top of our list. Every time we talk to another church, we ask them, what are you doing to defend biblical Christian ethics in your society? You know, I, I'd like to be on a fly on the wall when they go to Lambeth Palace because, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that the answer would be terribly satisfactory. No. <laughs> well, we're divided on that, but we're having good debate and honest discussion. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 320 of Anglican Transcriptivism from Moscow.